All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for tuning in to today's webinar uh, on how to be more strategic with your talent acquisition. My name is Nathan Owens uh, from UC San Diego Extension, and I am pulling up my slide deck for a quick introduction here. Get that going. So this is the Small Business Management Series. At a UC San Diego Extension, we've been running it uh, geez, three years now. So, uh, I, so far, so good. So, for today's agenda, uh, like I said, my name is Nathan Owens. I am the Associate Director for Strategic Initiatives at UC San Diego Extension, which part of my job includes putting together this series. And today's webinar is being recorded. We're going to post this on our YouTube channel in about a week or so. Uh, that way it can be available to you as a resource in case there was something you uh, missed that maybe you want to refer back to. And then also to make it available to the general public and anybody who wasn't able to tune in for the live session today. Our speaker today is Michael McGinnis. He is our, one of our instructors here at Extension, been an instructor with us for quite a while. And he's a very experienced talent acquisition leader. He's worked for a lot of companies, including names you may have heard of, like Bose, which I'm sure he'll touch on as we get into the, uh, his presentation today. So lots of knowledge and experience he's gonna share with you. And a quick note, uh, we are gonna do a Q&A today. Uh, we're definitely encouraging people to type stuff into chat as we go, and I can feed that to Michael as we go, so that way it can be a bit of a conversation. And then uh, also, if we get towards the end and there is time available, we can also have a, a, a bit more of a dedicated Q&A at the end. So I highly encourage you, whenever you have a question at any point, drop that in the chat and I will feed that to Michael for him to respond. I'll be keeping an eye on that chat box there. So. Before we get into it, real quick about UCSD Extension, if you are not familiar with it, we are the professional and continuing education arm of UC San Diego. We provide a lot of the lifelong learning through a huge number of courses, certificate programs. Uh, we even help support a couple of master's degrees offered through the main campus. Uh, we have K-12 programs, so we, we cover quite a wide range of uh, offerings, and uh, we are essentially a university within the university. So if you are curious about finding out more about the stuff that we offer, you can see the website URL down there in the lower left corner. For the Small Business Management Series, I have a couple partners that I've been working with for the past three years. Uh, these are two co-working spaces in downtown San Diego, downtown works and cross campus. So I would look forward to working with them as we continue doing the online webinar series and eventually uh, doing sessions live in person at, at their locations. As far as future topics in the series, I just published uh, the October session on business mentorship. So this is a, a, a session I'm excited to do because it's a partnership with SCORE. If you're not familiar with SCORE, they're an outreach program uh, supported by the Small Business Administration, and they have a lot of volunteer mentors who work with small business owners to work through uh, whatever issues they're dealing with, get advice, uh, guidance, and they have a lot of resources that people can make available. So I have three people from SCORE who are going to do that session, looking forward to it. And then there's a parallel series that some colleagues of mine at Extension are running on leadership and management topics. Uh, the next one they have coming up is building a customer service culture. So for my small business management series, uh, this is the URL for that. If you want to see what's coming up next, you can go there. And I'll drop this link into chat here in a second, as well as for the leadership and management essentials webinar series. I'll put that in chat too. So uh, before I turn things over to Michael, just want to let you know that this series is uh, almost entirely driven by people such as yourselves and issues that you're facing. So I want to make sure that the topics that get covered are relevant to what you're dealing with as somebody either running a small business or working with a small business. So if you have any ideas, suggestions, comments, please let me know. Uh, if it is something that you'd like to see covered in a future webinar uh, with over a thousand instructors and subject matter experts available through extension, there's a pretty good chance I can find the right person to put that on, somebody like Michael, who can talk about talent acquisition or whatever else you might be dealing with. So please feel free to send me an email and I will look to put something together. I'm currently thinking about November, so let me know. 
All right, with that, I will stop sharing that and turn things over to Michael and I will drop those links into chat here in a second. And again, if, as we get going, if you have any questions for Michael, feel free to put those in there and then I will let him know. So, all right, Michael, over to you. Great, just to check, audio check fine. All good. I'll check and, uh, and the screen is up? Yes. Perfecto. Great, good, well, thank you. And thank you everybody for making time in your day. Very, very much appreciated. The fact that, that you're interested you know, in a topic, I hope that I'll be able to deliver you some value today. And that value is really gonna focus on concept today of talent acquisition. It's one of the areas that I've been fortunate to have uh, led over the years uh, with a lot of global companies, last 15 years with Bose Corporation, the audio company. And I'm actually gonna begin with a little bit of a story that related to our own transformation to really help to understand today's topic, which is strategic talent acquisition. And the key word there is strategic. And, and this is gonna be the transformation that's taking place. And actually that was associated with a recent revision of our courses here with UCSD Extension, under the guidance of Maria Williamson, program manager uh, for this whole area. We really just revamped it and recently came up with the talent acquisition bootcamp. I'll have a couple slides on that just to let you know what that entails coming up. But really to begin with, this is what happens. You know, what happens in this process and why the change, right? Why do we need to change? Well, probably for any of you within your companies, you're experiencing the same thing we did. And that is, is that we had growing skills, skill gaps. You know, for us, a great example of that is, is that, you know, we were the producer, the, the producer of top quality audio products in the industry. But over time, things started to change. Competition grew stronger. They were producing better and better quality products themselves. Same time the millennials came in and they, their interest in, what, in audio was very different than what it was in the previous generations. Hey, they wanted it mobile, wanted to be able to, on speakers, to be able to combine uh, software intelligence uh, like the Alexa speakers. And so that drove a whole change within our organization. So it required us and me, the leader of both uh, talent management, which incorporated training and development and talent acquisition, to realize is that, wow, we were caught in the dark ages and we had to really change our ability to be able to develop the kinds of competencies. So with those changes at Bose that was happening, we realized is that, boy, if we wanted to integrate software in there, we never did that before. What does that look like? Who do we need? You know, and where are we going to get that talent from? You know, along with that inside, every function literally was going to have to develop new competencies with respect to understanding the smart speaker. How do we make it? How do we design that all the way down? How do we manufacture those? How do we incorporate that software design? How do we support this? So on and so forth. So that was just one example of the kinds of skill gaps that exist today. And that was just one. That was the tip of the iceberg. So what we realized is, is that like this PricewaterhouseCoopers survey came out is, is that the same time our senior management was really starting to get more and more involved and really, hey Mike, you know, what are we doing with respect to the town? We're getting some higher levels of turnover as some of our employees are going to our competition. What are we doing to lure in new talent? How are we training up our organization to be equipped for the direction that we're going? That herein was the change in conversation that started to create this whole makeover, that need for a makeover, because we didn't have the tools, we didn't have the capability to really be able to meet these ever-changing needs. But like that number below, 61% didn't know where to start, and that was like us. So what we had committed to is, is yes, senior management, we realize the need for this change, and we are about to endeavor on a step to do that. So we went out, first of all, and really researched the field, came to understand what was happening, exhausted with many of the key consultants in the field, Burson, who is now part of Deloitte, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and a number of them that really helped to educate us on what was happening. So the first thing that we did is, is created the problem statement. 
right? Is it, why do something? Well, we had a problem. And this is the, really the statement that we came up with and was the incorporation of a lot of the elements I just mentioned. We're more competitive. And as a result, we really needed to beef up our ability to be able to stay up and more because of our reputation to be the leader in the industry. And as a result, in order to do that, we, it wasn't about just bringing in talent. We realized that, hey, if we wanna be the top vendor of choice, we needed top talent to help get us there. So that was gonna really be stepping up our game with respect to how we attract in the kind of talent that's needed for today. Ultimately, we realized to compete and win that we had to develop a standardized global guidelines and resources that would help strengthen our employer brand, which is all about why would somebody want to come work for us, luring them in to demonstrate the, the kinds of opportunities and culture benefits that one is to get to be able to lure in the top talent today, because as we know, they all have choices today. So we could go back to positioning ourselves once again to being a best in class organization. The other thing we realized is that we were not alone in this journey. The more I started to connect with my counterparts and the in I realized that they were facing the same challenges. Some had already started out of the gate where we had, we realized we're still caught in the dark ages. So we had to really make a radical shift to becoming what we realized was a more strategic focus in terms of not only how we trained and developed our employees, but how we acquired, sourced our talent today, be able to bring in the top talent that we needed. So part of us looking out was looking at some of the models and frameworks that were out there. This one coming from Burson, a Deloitte company now, uh, is and they're experts really in HR functions and really helped to describe really just from a broad perspective, what was the evolution in talent acquisition? Well, when we looked at it and sat back and accurately assessed ourselves, boom, this is where we were. We were still operating back in a 1980, 1990s model of recruiting. Everything has sort of surpassed us over the years. Hey, we were getting the accolades from our hiring managers, bringing in the right people. It sort of kept us stagnant in the change. But since that time, we realized we were far, falling farther and farther behind. But it didn't stop there. We looked at another model. And this was another model that portrayed a little bit more detail with respect to the evolution or the maturity of an organization. So we looked at where we were. Ooh, it was hard to admit this, but bang, this is where we were, right? Reactive talent recruiting, right? The old order taking mentality, really go and respond to it as the needs come up and look at what was above there. We realized that we had a big mountain to climb. I'm not sure if this is a good time, Nathan, to launch that poll. Yep, I can do that. So on the maturity model. So this is for you to take a stab at where you are on this four level maturity model. So let me run that. Oh, outstanding. I mean, and not surprising, right? So first of all, hats off to you for, for taking that hard look and being able to accurately assess where we are where you are. I mean, that was what we did. And we realized this is that, hey, we needed to be able to change things. And even though you may be progressing well right now, the question is, is with the changes coming in the industry and in the work environments, et cetera, are we going to be able to compete and maintain that with what we're doing today? For most of us, the answer is no. By the way, it's great to see we've got some level three, level four in here. Hey, I'd love to connect with you too. As I said, one of the things that we do within the new boot camp is collaboration weeks. And we look to line ourselves up with guest speakers, presenters during that session and really get a chance to be able to share some of the great things that they're doing in the organization to help others as well. So be sure to take advantage of that and, and take me up on my offer to connect with me and so we can uh, do that going forward. All right, so I'm gonna implement that and we'll continue forward. Thanks for being a part of that. Well, so guess what? There were more models and frameworks. Again, all of this was happening unbeknownst to ourselves. We actually, this is by Jobvite, they actually had an assessment to take and once again, reality was upon looking at it and engaging ourselves in the assessment accurately, 
realized that again, we were still had a long ways to go. What we noticed is this word kept coming up, strategic, strategic, strategic. As you can see here on their top levels, that's the cornerstone of how they evaluate and how they identify that level of talent acquisition. So let's begin really with what this change is all about. And it begins with just getting on a common setting with respect to a definition. You know, recruiting, that the former way, it has a lot of nicknames on it, you know, the old order taker, the post and pray, kind of mentality of which, you know, a need comes up, go out there, you know, get the basics, hopefully have a job description to be able to post, you know, and then be able to, to go list that post and accumulate responses in the applicant tracking system and then go from there. Well, talent acquisition, being strategic, here is, is all about being early on. So it's the work of which you do before the need ever arises. So you're more proactive in this approach than you are reactive as well as strategic means that you're aligning the resources, the focus, the prioritization of talent towards what the business needs were. So in the case of Bose, we realized that we were way behind the curve with respect to software engineers. And now we had to go out there and compete with one role that was in huge demand across the industry and really bring in a number of software engineers to be able to help us move the needle in terms of how we were going to redesign our products. So that's what's really meant by strategic, aligning ourselves with the top of the organization to understand where they're going, what they're doing. So from a training perspective, we can define the competencies that that needs and then share that with the talent acquisition who then understand what is it that we need out there with respect to talent that we don't have internally. So what does this look like, this framework look like with respect to strategic talent acquisition? This is one of the best frameworks that I've seen available today. And what it does is it shows that talent acquisition is a function that's a part of a strategic process begins with the business strategy. What's happening? Our move towards smart speakers, for example. Then that drove along with other changes in the business that we would need growth zones, for example, you know, global business. So we had functions uh, with respect to APAC region that were growing, but even here locally with respect to oh, manufacturing centers, et cetera, is, is that we needed to really understand what were some of the hiring needs. So the work that we do with our other cohorts within human resources, such as training and development, compensation, et cetera, is to really to create what's referred to as a talent strategy or talent plan. That's a look at the year ahead and understanding where are we going, what's happening, and what are the implications on talent. We'll be increasing talent, we'll be decreasing talent, what are the kinds of changes that we'll be making so that we can early on begin to start getting geared up, knowledgeable in terms of what we have to do. In the center, you see talent acquisition since that's the focus here. And you see all of a sudden around it are a number of these yellow dots really portraying all of the new elements that are really going into a very robust, progressive and proactive talent acquisition function. From that, were measured by the results of our talent. Not just the time to fill, which is the, the primary measure today, but how well did the talent that we bring in perform in the performance reviews and so on and so forth. And so, wow, now all of a sudden we had to really pay attention to who we were hiring in because our, measure, our measurement on our performance and our bonus now was a reflection of how well the talent did and why not? Uh, why? Because, hey, that was what was going to help the whole business. And then therefore it was the business results that was going to be the ultimate telltale. So as a lean oriented company that Bose was, we brought in that skill set a few years prior, really adopted it within our manufacturing centers. We really started to apply some of the key principles of lean to our own process. The element, key element of lean is that everything is a process and to continually improve those processes, which is what makes it more cost efficient and effective and better meeting your internal and external customer needs. 
So in our case, the process was really around, we identified the five core processes that we had to really master to be able to meet the needs of this strategic talent acquisition, such things as candidate experience, analytical uh, analytics, and global recruiting process, right? So if you were to look up today, articles and research with respect to it, it's very consistent with these five areas, what, what companies need to do today to really improve their game with respect to talent and talent acquisition. Surrounding that is the outer circle, which is the sub processes that we really also needed to be able to put in place. So we quickly realized that this was no short term endeavor. This actually was a three year process that we put in place to allow us to put the appropriate focus, prioritize what we needed to do and ultimately to cover each of these functions. So now we had an understanding of what we needed to do. We had a framework, we knew where we currently stood. And so therefore we had the chance to really drive the and make the changes. But to do that, we also realized and great research repeated these same key themes. If you want to make this evolution from recruiting to talent acquisition, talent acquisition as we've defined it, you really need to have senior executives on board. They have to understand the need. They have to see that pain point with respect to talent and, and see the value of providing the appropriate resources and time to improve and embrace the whole concept of talent acquisition. The must is candidate experience. So far in the past, we really focused on the hiring manager, making sure that they were happy in here, and now it's the candidate. Candidate is as important as the hiring manager because obviously they have choices today, and if they're not happy with the experience, it's a bad reflection on the company for them, and all you have to do is go out to resources like Glassdoor today and see how that data is being accumulated and effective. So just like candidates, the candidates that we're looking at, they're looking at us as well. So we needed to make sure that they had a very positive experience with respect to what we were doing, even including challenging them, which is some of the things they really wanted today. The relationship between recruiters, well, formerly recruiter, recruiters and the hiring manager needed to change. It was not about just going, sit in a chair and basically getting the checklist completed and getting the job description and posting it and then coming back once you had your top list of candidates. It was about being the person who was really the consultant that you could go in and help to understand them and provide the trends that were happening in that industry pertaining to that role, where the talent is, the recent trends, the kind of salaries they're obtaining, where the talent is, and the different options that exist in there for, the, for bringing a net asset in, whether it meant doing it locally, remotely, opening up a new hub, et cetera. And of course, data today is, is become so important in every aspect of the business. You needed to make decisions much more on data. So we had to really redo our whole concept of analytics to really measure the things that were most important, including candidate experience. Yes, still time to fill, but quality of hire was becoming more and more. Cost of hire was becoming other key metrics that we needed to start looking at. Then as we looked out at what other companies were doing, again, it was our wake up call. We realized, wow, you know, they're already jumping on all of these things, social media for recruitment. Well, you know, we didn't really have much going on in that space. And yet, so important today that you're in that space because that's where the talent is shopping, is looking, checking out. All of these other elements were very characteristic of companies who were making that kind of transition. So in effect, this is really what modern and strategic talent acquisition is really all about. It's focusing on these items that are shown here to make them important, integrate them into the process so that you can much more effectively compete and attract the top talent that you need in your organization today and help your company, most importantly, achieve its business strategy. Another key element of the transition was the change to the recruiter role itself. 
It's a key element with respect to our training and the boot camp coming up. This is really about this transition from recruiter to talent advisor. Again, as you see here, it was about taking the old order taker mentality uh, to really be giving them a much more proactive, making use of the tools and resources that are available today, challenging now the hiring manager assumptions, being in that position of expertise, of knowledge, to be able to do that appropriately. In fact, again, resources like CEB, you know, really hit it on the head with the statement here. To succeed in the new work environment, companies must build strategic recruiters capable of managing complex talent pipelines. Wow, powerful word there. We didn't even really know what that meant, but now we do. And advising the business on talent needs and labor market conditions. And the reality was, this is as they identify talent advisors, similar to what we had done, is that really only one in five recruiters today really are proficient and geared up. And that's the gap that we see existing and why, again, we put the emphasis on the boot camp to really to help fill that as a gap. You know, furthering that, we saw more information out there about what that meant, what were some of the skills and competencies of the talent advisor role. Again, they needed to grow in their business acumen to really understand the nature of the business, as well as to know the labor market, what's happening and out there. It's incredible today because new tools are available out there to provide you with it. Not surprising this day and age of, of data, data everywhere that there's been new developments of resources like in this case, Talent Neuron. You know, it's now, it was acquired and Gartner has it now, marketing it, an incredible system that we brought in to pose that really allowed us to really ascertain where's the talent today? What's the trend? How much are they making? You know, does it open up the idea of searching locally? Does it change it now to a virtual or different type of a role? And being able to get all of this data that allowed the new now talent advisor to be equipped with data to go in there to have with the hiring manager in that conversation. But in addition to this, it wasn't just those elements that were pushing for the change in talent acquisition. Even pre-COVID, the nature of work was continually changing. You know, as there was numerous articles and research on it, I think it sums it up here. Changes in how people work will accelerate even more over the next few decades. Well, I don't know if they were aware at the time that, that COVID was coming, because that sure has had a marked difference and will continue to have an ever presence in terms of changes in how we work, how we operate, which will have a direct impact on how we acquire talent today, how we recruit, require talent. Matter of fact, there's a lot of research coming out right now too. This is one of them came out by Gartner and it talked about the 10 different changes that were taking place related to recruiting going forward. And I captured three of them. Number one, increase in remote working, right? We're all there now, but now post COVID, it will be interesting how many of your workers will still want to be remote? What are the many benefits associated with the reduction of price? We ourselves experienced that opposed, we started that 10 years ago. And we really understood the whole concept of working virtually. I was one of the early uh, individuals to sort of pilot the concept of it. Once they realized, wow, it can really work, it can be effective, it actually has a lot of cost efficiencies associated with it as well, we begin to move in that direction. Well, so what does that ultimately mean? Now, all of a sudden, the question started to come up as we were looking for talent today, and as we looked at the data on systems like Talent Neuron, we realized that, hey, we don't have to look local anymore. We're getting good at this. And actually now with COVID has sort of pushed us into this uncomfort zone for many companies, really being able to develop this ability to be able to work remotely. And now as a matter of fact, we have the majority, a lot of our workers are remote. They're global in effect uh, within Bose. And we work often in hubs, we utilize entities. Uh, Nathan mentioned the downtown works. 
hubs like that where we started to accumulate groups of individuals and we started this whole different way of operating and we had fortunately were able to make considerable cost savings with corporate corporate real estate in fact just this morning i edited this slide and that top left hand is a quote from josh burson he again is has been years as the recognized leader with respect to where hr is going and it just said today, who is the new hot job, head of remote work, right? And it's a new title that is developing as the realization is, is that that most likely is going to be very representative of the workplace, not only now, but for the future as well. So it's a great time uh, to ask another poll. Nathan, you want to launch that poll? Sure thing. Let me pull that up. So just a repeat the question for the recording. Uh, are you planning on keeping the remote virtual option post COVID? And it looks like about two thirds of you are. So let me stop that and share it. Well, that's increasingly a part of what the anticipation is. Those who really look forward and see the workplace post COVID realizing that that's a place. And, and obviously there's those centers like manufacturing that individuals need to be on site. But now as we've learned that most functions can operate virtually, and it'll be interesting. I know as I talk to others, even neighbors and others, and I see the research, as they'll go out, many of them are looking forward to aspire to that social kind of connection back, but it won't be long as many presume or potential is, is that they start hitting that two hour commute and start asking the question, you know, wait a minute, do I really want this? And it'll be elements like that, along with the other benefits they've experienced that now may challenge work environments to move in that direction because employees might leave to go to more virtual roles. So something to consider, but again, it's gonna be a real example of talent acquisition in terms of, can we hire that? Can we provide that option today and all of a sudden open up the capability to say, you know what, we don't have to focus on just San Diego. We can go to where the talent is, and particularly for those areas that we don't have a lot of that capability here in San Diego. So let's see, close on this. And we're starting to close in on here. So let's uh, focus on this. This is in addition to the workplaces, this whole concept, when you start doing research on what's happening in the workplace, realize that everything in the word cloud here is, is happening. I've since amazed at, at what's happening with gig economy, portfolio careers, the number of people migrating now into freelance type work. There's so many more capabilities to provide the talent that companies need, as well as globally, and as the third one demonstrates, looking at it very differently that you can start taking advantage of this growing trend now to these co-work spaces. In addition to that, and Bill Gates called it in 2000, and I remember him saying it, in 20 years, employees will be free agents, and he's spot on. If you start looking at the trends and data as shown here from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, each year, the average tenure within organizations is reducing. 25 to 34 years old, 2.8 years. Why? Because that's the nature. They've adapted well to the changes in the business climate. They realize that things are changing. They've lived with people like myself who has gone through two and three layoffs over the course of a career. And they've adapted by realizing that the better way to manage careers today is, is by making the hops, increasing their title, increasing their salary, very much uh, typically getting greater gains on those than if you stay within a company. So. How is that going to change? Again, going to have a huge impact. You look at companies like Netflix who revised human resources and talent acquisition to adapt to this model. And they've been incredibly successful. Obviously, the results is if you look at uh, what Netflix is doing today and how they've run into all of these new markets incredibly effectively, they've adapted to this changing work environment and really are providing a setting that's very conducive with these types of changes. So this is a good way to sort of summarize, a lot was covered there in a, a little bit, to really look at the changes that are coming that's requiring many companies to focus on making the change. To help support that, that's the reason and rationale, we decided to 
update, revise our curriculum here. So came up with the Talent Acquisition Bootcamp. It's a nine week program. I'll get a little more specific on that in just a moment here, but the essence of it, the focus of this bootcamp, as it says here in bold, is to acquaint you with the critical basic knowledge and trends that'll help make you successful. That's all concept. As an educator myself forever, being an educator in my career, the value that we have here, the true value proposition is, is if we can develop you with the knowledge, skills, awareness, and capabilities to really develop yourself. Number one, you can help make that robust within your company. Number two, as an individual, you're making yourself more valuable for an effective career in talent acquisition today. The makeup of it is nine weeks. As I mentioned, it's 100% virtual. And there's three three-week blocks, which make up the nine weeks. Talent acquisition, a focus on that, what it is, talent sourcing, really zooming in in the process by which companies today are really being more proactive and sourcing talent. And critical today is, is the ability to bring them on to be able to make it a great experience up front because of the realization of how many people leave by having a poor onboarding experience. So the first and second week of each of these three-week blocks really focuses on self-paced content, give you a look and feel of what that looks like. And then the third week is a Zoom collaboration session. This is an example of the week content, in this case, week four. It's an integration in of a lot of great video content that's already out there. No reason to reinvent the wheel when it's really best said. And then a number of different self-paced modules that really get into the elements making up the topic for that week, along with some discussions, some reading assignments, and a knowledge check at the end. The collaboration sessions, as I mentioned, there's three of them during this. We've already lined up great speakers for week three and week six. So we're bringing in speakers, as I've mentioned, that have really made this change, very aware of this change. Many of them have gone through previously the talent acquisition certificate program we had, and they're now coming back to help educate, collaborate, and work with others and helping to educate them from their perspective, their work environment. A person like Greg Klaus, who's uh, heads up the largest biotech, uh, bio life sciences uh, organization, a resource organization in the world today. And obviously, a great resource with respect to talent acquisition, as well as the others listed here. So it allows us some time. Let's see. Yes, did it. This is exactly where I was hoping to finish up here, to have 20 minutes here for some Q&A. So I'm going to close the stop share. All right and open it up and and nathan you may have collected some thoughts comments questions we could start there or we can open it up so yeah we uh if you do have a question uh feel free to drop that into chat uh one uh, general uh question that maybe michael can respond to is if your organization is dealing with a, a particular challenge or challenges in talent acquisition if you want to mention that uh, in, in the chat, we can have Michael talk about that as well. So while people are, are contemplating their questions for you, uh, I, I have one for you, Michael. So where, where do you think the, the workplace or, or the workforce is, is going? How's it going to involve, evolve now in a post-COVID environment? It's a great question. And I think there's, there's like, like the COVID itself, uh, has, nobody has the crystal ball. We're all learning as we go here, which is probably the best way to sort of stage a response here is, is what we know today, what I could share today is, is going to be influenced and impacted by 20, 30 other things that come out of this. Is this a continual process? Is, is the process of this type of pandemic and virus going to continue in this form as it mutates? Does it, is it going to retain the need of a type of environment that's supportive of this or not. Obviously, again, single factor like that could have huge implications on it. But based on what we know, and let's assuming that we are able through a vaccine to be able to get control of this process, 
question is, is what will happen? Well, already organizations have been relooking at the process of corporate real estate, realizing that, you know, is continue to work virtually. There's a lot of, of money to be saved just from letting go of some of the corporate real estate holdings, as we discovered at Bose. Obviously, the other benefits of it is, is now knowing that we can bring in talent wherever they are. And, you know, but again, it's going to require new competencies. We're going to need to really learn and master how do we lead, manage virtual teams? You know, how do we really engage and train them? Well, one of the parts that we learned at Bose early on, and I actually was a large part of it being in the pilot, was training others in terms of how to work virtually, how to really manage yourself on that time. So anticipation is, is that'll have a large impact. We saw two thirds you know, of, our, of the respondents here saying that in some form or mode that that'll be continuing on. It's pretty much what the prediction is. So that obviously is, is a key one. Then I think with respect to talent acquisition, it's really going to change with respect to understanding where do we search for talent today? Number one, what does that look like? How do we get ahead of the needle so that we're not reactive in scope? How can we start to learn and work with our management teams to really identify and create a, a talent plan forward? That's magic. It's so powerful, the companies that make that transition. It's hard at first because the companies are not accustomed to thinking that way. But again, it's a very strategic focus. They're doing that for the rest of the organization with respect to the kinds of equipment they're going to need, the kinds of elements they'll need to acquire like software, intelligence, information, people staffing, et cetera. So if we can help to influence that, that process of becoming more proactive and understanding what's out there, it's a major win. I know what happened is, is that by the time typically I'll give you a great example of it is, is that as we started to look at particularly senior leaders that, and we were spending oodles of money with them with respect to external search firms, you know, paying their search fees. Well, now as we were developing greater understanding, some of that expertise and knack in terms of how do you search for a senior talent, we knew that in six months, for example, we were going to be looking at a CFO. They were going to retire, be replaced, or whatever the case may be. Well, so what did they do? They started to get acquainted with that field and started to go out there and proactively start making connections with individuals they identified by their own searches on talent using LinkedIn Recruiter. So guess what? By the time the position was ready to fill, they already had their top 10. They already had the list of individuals ready to go, prepped up. They were eager. They wanted to really, you know, they wanted to proceed. And it allowed us to really be able to jump in. Time to fill was reduced significantly as a result. You know, and as a result, we already had that. And we basically, in effect, replaced the need to have the ATS in many cases. And that was that nightmare of, right, going through those who have those know that, oh, my God, 200 resumes in there. I'm not going through all of those. I don't have the time. How do we do it? So I think that along with technology and the new kinds of resources, artificial intelligence is here. It's still early on. So it's kind of thing that probably won't see a lot of companies embracing today or tomorrow, but it'll become very present within organizations and talent acquisition today. Have them learn, have them be able to program the sequence that your top recruiters do in terms of going out there and sourcing talent, coming back with that list of information. And so that'll allow the recruiter, in effect, to really focus on their biggest value, which is the FaceTime, the connection with the recruiter, luring them in, talking with them, getting to know them, and releasing some of that extra busy work to AI and other technology. So I think that's some of the many elements that we'll see uh, happening today. Some are happening regardless of, of COVID and others are as a result of COVID. I hope that helps. Uh, pretty, pretty thorough. Uh, we do have a related question. Uh, it, we are finding our most successful recruiting is coming from social media, primarily specialized Facebook groups and LinkedIn. Do you have any other recommendations? Oh, that's really good. You know, it's, it's uh, Twitter has really been coming on strong. There's a lot of recruiters that are really have Twitter accounts. 
they're utilizing that more and more to really to connect with potential candidates. It has that nice benefit of being brief, brief kind of discussions and connections with it. So Twitter is definitely something to consider. Uh, Twitter has acquired uh, TweetDeck. So you can actually go to TweetDeck, all one word, dot com, uh, and actually create dashboards you know, of talent. So that uh, I know I utilize that with my, as I do some career coaching with my clients, they have a created dashboard for the kinds of roles that they're seeking and they see real time kind of jobs that are surfacing. So I think that to change to really be able to provide job, job access, job communications and social media spot on. Whoever the person was asking it, great, you, you got it because that clearly is, is the trend. You know, Instagram, TikTok even, you know, all of these things that are really creating a presence is a place where we want to be. It's perfect. What it's really powerful for, it's the opportunity for branding. As a part of developing not only your company, but particularly talent acquisition, is developing your employees into brand ambassadors. So identify those talent. Help develop your employees so that they're speaking positively of the company and then turn them on, unleash them into the social media, even giving them incentives. You know, I've seen restaurants, for example, of which that they provide their employees with a coupon code of which they can then disseminate to their contacts and others. And when that coupon code gets used on it, they get a little bit of a bonus for each time that that's used on it. So there's a whole new methodology you know, about utilizing social media and learning to adapt to it. For me, it was a big adaptation, right? I, I was characteristic of one of those that didn't really touch social media, kept it sort of at arm's length. Now it's not the case. LinkedIn was mentioned, powerful, powerful resource. That is the lay of the land, the number one resource today for recruiting. Executive search firms, the Corn Ferry and others, they live out on it, they camp on it. That's their way of which they're identifying potential candidates, get so much better information about a potential candidate by looking at a three-dimensional profile, right? In color compared to a two-page written resume that anybody can say anything today. So it's spot on, it's just a small list of some of the many examples of it. I'd say is know your client, Know your clientele, know your candidates, find out where they're, what, what social media they're using and get connected on it. And the more you can connect your, your own employees as brand ambassadors to that, you can significantly uptick. You really create this whole amazing employee referral program because now it can be your employees that are helping you through their communications to really let others know and their connections know of job openings. All right, excellent question. Since this series is, is often focused on the small business uh, community, but we get people who also are coming from larger organizations, in terms of resources to develop your strategic plan around talent acquisition, thoughts, comments about you know, coming from a small business where you may be wearing multiple hats, uh, you know, product developer slash HR slash marketing, you know, uh, versus a company where you have dedicated people for that talent acquisition function. Oh, it's a great question. And here we are in San Diego, right? 90% of businesses here, small to medium size in, in nature. You have your classic HR office of one, right? You know, the person there covers all HR functions and recruits and anything else that might be coming up. So very, very characteristic. In fact, we devoted one of the weeks really focuses in on talent acquisition for the small business. The reality is, is all of the elements apply. It's just, you don't have the resources uh, to be able to, to conduct it. So we actually did a presentation, Nathan, it was a while back on this topic. And there are many things you can do, for example, uh, number one is is brand ambassador. You know, focus on your whole branding concept. Small companies can have such a big advantage today, but they don't demonstrate that. Get those top employees that are working for your firm to really to be able to tell their story. Have it created as videos. Hunter Industries did an example of that. 
characteristic, you know, medium size manufacturing firm, created an incredible video that's out there. So for those searching for a job, have a great video that really portrays the culture. It's neatly made, right? It's cool. It's not this formal production that really entices individuals to really consider what, what Hunter Industries is all about. To me, that's a, a great, it's a quick win. It's an easy tool to do because the resources are plentiful. It does require getting familiar with the social media, where to place this, how to do that and communicate. Well, you know how you learn about that? From your employees. They know more, in my case, than I did as is the leader about social media. So I reached out to them. What do you do? Where can you communicate? What's hot today? What's not? You know, and doing it. And, and then beginning to develop, as I mentioned, the employees into brand ambassadors. You know, number two is, is that it's all about the candidate experience today. It really is. So that's a way is whether or not you formally measure it or not, as long as you really understand the concept of recruiting today from the candidate's perspective and be able to align your process to that. So know that they're going to look you up on Glassdoor. Know they're going to look. And so if that's the case, then you want to be prepared to be able to talk about some of those negatives that are coming out because it's going to be on their minds on it. The other thing is, is that you really can just really, uh, you know, conduct it with a candidate in mind, interviewing, develop a good, strong, robust interview process. Again, you don't need a lot of time, money, or external resources to do that. Make it really challenging, which is what the good talent wants, not just some quick Passover really identify the competencies you're looking for, understand behavioral interviewing and reorient your interviewing that way. Again, you can read books, you know, on it, performance, uh, performance interviewing is, is the great topic, the sort of features is behavioral interviewing, learn and then be able to apply these things in the ways that really present to the client. Be sure that when they're on site, let them know, tell them the advantages of what it looks like. Have some of your other resources in the company, particularly senior management available to it. It's amazing that when you talk to candidates and we talk to ours and we offered that earlier on, initially as a chance to do it, the highlight of that is, wow, so nice to meet the president of your company. I mean, I, that was amazing that they made their time. Well, they made their decision very often on our company because of little moments of truth. We used, we used to call them like that too. So there are a number of things. It's just a matter of what is changing and then finding that simple way to really bring those in, in these little ways that really are gonna make a big difference on your process. All right. Thank you very much for that, Michael. Okay, well, I think that about wraps it up for today. Um, I need to go back on. So appreciate all everybody tuning in. Uh, Michael, thank you for the excellent presentation and overview of how to be more strategic with your talent acquisition. I'm gonna send a, a follow-up email as I mentioned in the chat, which will include a copy of Michael's slide deck and uh, include that discount code that Maria mentioned for the talent bootcamp, if that's something that you're interested in, in participating. So you can do a real deep dive on this stuff and get Michael's hands-on, you know, focused attention uh, and, and really up your game around talent acquisition. So with that, uh, I, I want to say thank you uh, and appreciate everybody's participation and hope to see you in the next one. So take care and stay safe. Thank you.